Well, good morning. It's good to see you all. And uh, I am uh, I'm glad for the chill in the air. I think fall is, uh, or autumn, is Louisville's greatest season. And uh, I hope you're enjoying it as much as uh, I am and anticipating uh, what will be unfolding. I tell people that uh, we get robbed in the spring. You know, spring is two days. But uh, autumn, autumn lasts longer, and that's, uh, that's really sweet. I'm, as a Floridian, you know, our four seasons were summer. <laughs> and uh, so it's, it's good to have something uh, showing us. The, and by the way, the rhythm of the seasons is so important to understanding literature, poetry, and the Scripture. With the, uh, the changing of the seasons becoming a metaphor for so much of, uh, of biblical theology. And we turn to the Scripture now, we're back in Leviticus, and we are in the closing uh, hours of our study of Leviticus. We are nearing the end of the book, and uh, we'll soon be turning elsewhere, but I hope you have found the study of Leviticus really rewarding and raising some of the most basic issues of biblical theology, revelation of biblical truth, and, uh, and a yearning for Christ. What we see Christ fulfilling is what we see so detailed. Uh, here in the book of Leviticus. This morning, we're in Leviticus chapter 24, and we'll begin with a word of Scripture. As we turn, actually, I meant to say we'll begin with a word of prayer. So let's start there. Our Father, we come before you and thank you just for the honor of studying your word and the honor of studying your word together. Father, it is such a, a great and wonderful thing that it is not only that we study your word alone where we experience so much spiritual growth, but that we experience the study of your word together as a congregation of believers for even more explosive growth. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit will glorify you and open our eyes that we may see as we turn to your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, now we turn to Scripture. And uh, we're going to begin in verse 17 of chapter 24. Whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good, life for life. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, and whoever kills a person shall be put to death. You shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native. For I am the Lord your God. So Moses spoke to the people of Israel, and they brought out of the camp the one who had cursed and stoned him with stones. Thus the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. Well, We've got to have a hard talk here. Uh, this is one of those passages that causes some modern people to recoil in, in horror. What we face here is a holiness code that comes with retributive justice. And uh, the formula appears very cold, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Lex talionis is the term. And, and there's a very interesting phenomenon to this that, uh, that causes us to have to step back and think a bit. For one thing, civilization means law. Culture means law. The state of being uncivilized as compared to the state of being civilized includes the adoption of some kind of law. Every single culture, by definition, is a culture of law. Some law, some legal logic, some moral logic. Anarchy literally means that it, there is no authority, no archy, but that means also there is no order of law. For years in the United States, uh, one of the most popular programs was a crime investigation known as Law and Order. And uh, some of you will remember the iconic beginning of that program, uh, and, and that is that the administration of justice and the, the maintenance of peace requires two different dimensions, uh, the police who uh, apprehend the criminals 
and uh, the prosecutors uh, who, who prosecute them. These are their stories. Well, that's a pretty sophisticated system of law. If, if you just take criminal law in the United States and, and you look at the highly developed criminal law of the United States, that had to come from somewhere. It had to come from something. And, and as you track back, you can see it comes, well, well English common law is a part of that. Uh, but it's not just uh, English common law. It's not just European, the law of Christendom and the Holy Roman Empire. It goes all the way back to the Roman Empire itself and goes all the way back to the Greeks and goes all the way back to biblical roots. The lex talionis put in its context is a limiting factor, and this is what's kind of difficult for us to understand. The lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, or, or a life for a life, was actually a, a signal moral and legal achievement. Do you think we ought to close that door? It just sounds like we're at war right outside in that hallway. Does that, does that work? Okay, I, while they demolish the rest of the building, maybe we should uh, continue with the Bible study. Thank you very much. Um, the destruction of the buildings evidently distracted me for a moment. I'm sorry. The, uh, the, the, the Lex Talionis says you can only take one life for a life. You can only take a tooth for a tooth or an eye for an eye. And it is because the first achievement of law is limiting retribution. So we have to think theologically here. So as, as we think theologically, let's just think about the fact that retribution evidently is a part of human experience and a part of a human moral urge. And uh, that turns out to be important. So in other words, if you hurt something precious to me, justice seems to imply that I do something to you. If you act in a way that injures the society, then an innate Romans 1 kind of sense of justice says, we as a society should do something to you. Now, you can say, well, we're more sophisticated than that. Our system of justice is not retributive justice. It's, uh, it's restorative justice, or it's, uh, it's the justice of rehabilitation. Yeah, how far has that gotten us? In our society, for example, uh, there, there was a, a huge movement, and, and by the way, much of the uh, moral philosophy of the 18th and 19th centuries in the English-speaking world was actually devoted to uh, a system of law and justice and trying to figure out if there's anything other than retribution that should be put in its place. I mean, we're far more humane people, right, than ancient peoples. We're far more humane than that. So uh, even the idea of, the, uh, of the, the penitentiary rather than the jail became an issue. And what's the difference? Just think of the word, the penitentiary. The, 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 that's a place where Criminals would not be so much punished as brought to the moment of penance, the penitentiary. And uh, the problem was that the prisoners did not cooperate by coming to the moment of penance. And uh, so the penitentiary was supposed to be just a place of shorter duration where people would, under the right moral influence, uh, turn in the right moral direction. This was also a part of a general liberalizing of the culture in which, you know, sin and wrongdoing were even then kind of being redefined, even as in the 20th century it would be uh, psychologized. Or, or you have Anders Behrens Breivik. If you remember the name of Arn, uh, Anders Behrens Breivik, he killed something like 60 people, including a lot of teenagers uh, in Scandinavia. And uh, they have no death penalty. And as a matter of fact, the, the highest penalty they have is 20 years in prison. Okay, now that, that appears to be a problem. Uh, and by the way, it is a problem. Ander, Anders Behrens Breivik has like an apartment uh, in Scandinavia, uh, Norway, I believe, where he carried out uh, this, this mass murder, one of the worst mass murders in, in, in modern history. And, and so the Scandinavians are proud of their far more humane system of justice than in the United States. So, for instance, they have no sentence even of life in prison. And, uh, and, and so they, uh, they, they say, no, he can only be sentenced to, I think it was either 14 or 20 years in prison, even for all of these mass murders. Okay, now that raises the obvious question. Are they going to, and, and it must have been 10 years ago now, 
So four years from now, are they going to let him out? And the answer is no. No. Uh, at least we hope and pray no. Uh, and uh, the reason is that uh, the, uh, the psychiatrist is never going to clear him and is going to continue to consider him a threat to public order or whatever. Well, that's just, I, I think, a dishonest life sentence. I mean, because there is no sane person who thinks someone who killed 70 people is going to be let out. Like, okay, he's over that. The penitentiary worked. Look how penitent he, penitent he is. Um, the Pope, the current Pope, who uh, is theologically confused on any number of issues, speaking generously, uh, he's very much against the death penalty. And uh, he acknowledges the death penalty is in Scripture, but the Roman Catholic Church, uh, under its claimed authority of doctrinal modification, has found that the death penalty is, is sub-Christian. It's not in the Bible, but it is in, in the Roman Catholic Church. But, uh, but beyond that, he also recently said that uh, life in prison is sub-Christian, and no society should practice uh, life in prison, and... Uh, and solitary confinement is, uh, is unchristian, inhuman, and should not be practiced. Uh, but even the people who, uh, who run the prisons in Italy have to practice uh, basically all those things uh, because solitary confinement uh, is sometimes absolutely necessary in order to prevent a murder uh, in prison. But, uh, you know, reality intrudes. But the, the reason I'm bringing all that up is because Retributive justice, even though we say we're too modern for that, we're, that's just not so. That's not so. Uh, when you have some crime that is so atrocious, and unfortunately we have many of them, we have many crimes that are so atrocious, and, and by the way, this works on both the right and the left politically in the United States. The left supposedly is not for prison until they are, in which case they're for a lot of prison. And, uh, and but but... This is not a right-left debate that I intend to address this morning, but just to say that God has put a hunger for retributive justice in the human heart. This is a part of the Imago Dei. And uh, the question is, though, what kind of limitation should be put upon that? Because in a society where you do not have the rule of law, and Israel is a society with the rule of law, this is what the rule of law looks like, then an individual or a family or a tribe could take out inordinate retribution. And this is the situation of pre-civilization, where someone on your tribe, you know, offends someone on our tribe, and so we go to war to kill you over an insult. And, I mean, you know enough world history to know occasions in which things like that happen. Or you take it out of a situation of, state or government actors, and you just, you just have, say, an individual, and uh, something happens to someone he loves, and he takes out retribution, you know, four and five times the original offense. So everywhere the rule of law pertains, the historians of law see the lex talionis, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, as an incredible and necessary achievement. If there is a murder, you try and punish the murderer, not the entire society, not the entire tribe, not the entire family. This is a very, very different form of, uh, of justice than in the pre-civilized world. Now there's an interesting question. How is it that the Lex Talionis, whether it's known as that or not, how is it that it shows up so many places uh, even without biblical revelation? And there we have to believe that it's a part of the common grace and common revelation, general revelation that, again, Bible testifies about and you see in Romans chapter 1. The conscience that says there must be a punishment for this sin also seems to cry out this has to be a proportionate punishment for this crime. A uh, Mikado, the, uh, the famous musical, the punishment must fit the crime, the punishment must fit the crime. Well, in this case, remember this is in the context of a man who was an Israelite woman's son, whose father was an Egyptian, 
who horribly blasphemes. And God says he is to be put to death. That's the, that is the law. He explains, however, that short of that, through Moses, he says, whoever takes a human life shall surely be put to death. Well, okay. I mean, that makes sense to us. Uh, homicide shall surely be put to death. And in the Old Testament, there doesn't appear to be the kind of, uh, of stratification and definition of forms of homicide that we would see in later development. So, you know, we have by accident. Now, that is reflected. That is reflected later in, 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 in the law. But it, it's not made a statute in the way we would think of it today. And so, for instance, when we talk about murder in the United States, generally we're talking about what the law would define as first-degree murder, uh, premeditated murder. And yet there are, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, many other degrees uh, of murder. I mean, if there's first-degree murder and there's third-degree murder, there's at least three of them. Um, but, but, but as you look at this, Capital punishment is decreed over and over again, but as you know, as the law unfolds, beyond what you see here, a lot of protections are put in place. For example, an evidentiary standard is required for finding someone guilty of murder that is far beyond uh, what a court would demand today. It's the same principle, and that is a witness to the crime. Uh, someone who can prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the crime took place. Now, in the society of Israel as a nation, uh, and, and by that we mean as a political unit as well as God's covenant nation, uh, two eyewitnesses were often required uh, just to be able to attest to the fact that this is how it happened before punishment can be meted out. So, you know, some of you may know that there have been uh, occasions like in the American West with... Uh, 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 <laughs> working towards a rule of law. And, uh, and in places uh, such as uh, uh, Sicily, that would be one, but, but there also would be others, where you get these rounds and rounds and rounds of retribution. And uh, the biblical principle here is to stop that. So the person who kills shall die, others not. And then beyond the human being, there's more. Whoever takes an animal's life shall make it good, life for life. If you, uh, if you kill someone's ox, you owe them an ox. Pretty easy to understand. You don't owe them a life. So this is a limiting factor. It's a proportionality. And the first proportionality has to do with the fact that every single human being is made in God's image and thus requires the penalty of death. And again, that goes back to Genesis 9 and uh, the Noahic covenant. When uh, God said to Noah that if, uh, if, if a man takes another man's life by his hand, then he forfeits his own life. And, and you see that working its way out here. All right. For an animal, you just owe the other animal. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, whatever injury is given a person shall be given to him. Now, this, this raises a question. Okay. So does this mean an accident? Well, as, as it works out, and, and as you work out the biblical narrative, and as you just think about how this would work, I mean, clearly, uh, there are times when, uh, when moral agency is implied and is clear, and there are times when moral agency is not clear. And, and so, basically, you have a way of working that out. It's not so much about accidents, uh, more likely, uh, some kind of fight or, or something else. Uh, but in any event, again, it is to limit. If someone breaks your arm, you may not lawfully take his life. Whoever kills an animal, verse 21, shall make it good. Whoever kills a person shall be put to death. There's that very clear distinction between uh, the animals not made in God's image and every single human being who is you shall, in verse 22, very interesting, you shall have the same rule for the sojourner and for the native, for I am the Lord your God. Okay, now this works both ways. So the sojourner is not a part of the covenant community, but is among the covenant community, and under the law is to be treated just like 
a member of the covenant community would be treated. There's not one law for the sojourner and another for the covenant citizen of Israel. Verse 23, so Moses spoke to the people of Israel and they brought out of the camp the one who had cursed and stoned him with stones. Thus the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. So this again is very, very important. The execution takes place outside the camp. So think of all the, all the things that take place outside the camp. Uh, there are certain physical processes of elimination that have to take place outside the camp. There is the burial of all carcasses, uh, of all animals eaten or a sacrifice that must be taken outside the camp. Uh, the bodies of those who are buried are buried outside the camp. And, uh, and now the one who will be uh, executed is executed outside the camp. And, you know, this, this will take us, even as we're thinking of the crucifixion narrative in the Gospels, uh, Christ is taken outside the camp. The uh, scapegoat of the Old Testament is driven outside the camp. Uh, so this is just very, very important. This becomes a principial issue, and it shows you the boundary inside the camp, inside Israel, or outside the camp. The distinction turns out to be massive. Then in verse 25, and, and by the way, as you're just thinking about the, 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 the law, you think of a passage like Deuteronomy 19 or Exodus 21, the same principle is given uh, that you see here. As I said, the book of Leviticus is coming to a close. We have just a couple of chapters uh, ahead. And some of what we have seen already is repetition. Repetition from other passages inside Leviticus and also uh, repetition that is uh, coming from other texts of Scripture. In verse 20, in verse in, uh, 1 of chapter 25, the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. All right, this is fascinating. And if you're not surprised by this, you should be. I, uh, I realize that, uh, that there's a familiarity with Scripture that means that we're not actually surprised by things that, that should surprise us. This one should get our attention. We are to observe the Sabbath as God. God's people, and I'm saying we hear Israel. Uh, Israel is called to the Sabbath, and the Sabbath has been defined so carefully. But the earth is to keep a Sabbath. That's something we might not have expected. So let's look to the passage. The Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you, the land shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. For six years you shall sow your field, and for six years you shall prune your vineyard and gather in its fruits. But in the seventh year there shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest for the land, a Sabbath to the Lord. You shall not sow your field or prune your vineyard. You shall not reap what grows of itself in your harvest or gather the grapes of your undressed vine. It shall be a year of solemn rest for the land. The Sabbath of the land shall provide food for you, for yourself and for your male and female slaves and your hired servant and the sojourner who lives with you and for your cattle and for the wild animals that are in your land. All its yield shall be for food. The bottom line is that this is not Israel discovering the principle of crop rotation and soil rest, but it is God dictating it. Uh, one of the problems that you see throughout ancient history is that civilizations, and, and you see this happen uh, repeatedly, where uh, civilizations either grow weak or disappear because they have exhausted the soil. And uh, even right now, just in terms of international headlines having to do with, for instance, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. A part of what makes Ukraine so attractive uh, is the fact that, uh, much like the American uh, Midwest, it is incredibly fertile land. It's the, it's the breadbasket of that entire uh, section of uh, the Eurasian landmass. 
and uh, it, is, it is much to be envied. But all soil requires rotation or it becomes exhausted. And it requires a, a everything from what would now be practiced as cover crops and rotation to, uh, to rest for the soil itself. Uh, when Mary and I are driving out in rural Kentucky, as we do, you know, we, we will come across uh, you know, even something like a field, a beautiful field, it's very strange, of rapeseed. That's all that yellow, that just incredibly vibrant yellow that grows. And, and you, know, you could think that's a weed. No, that's actually been sown. That has actually been sown. Grapeseed, by the way, has been turned into a, a, an agricultural oil uh, itself. But the original use of something like grapeseed uh, was in order, because it grew very fast uh, and had a lot of uh, calories in it, was so that it would be turned under back into the soil and would, would just add nutrients to, to, to the soil as kind of a crop rotation. This would require some planning, wouldn't it? I mean, if, if, if you're going to have a harvest six out of seven years, but not a seventh year, then, uh, then, then you're going to have to plan. Now, remember that the main food is grain. The main food is grain. And grain can be stored. And so you see, for example, even in the Exodus, remember that, that, uh, that Egypt was strong because of its granaries. In other words, it had massive stockpiles of grain. So Israel will require a stockpiling of grain uh, in, in order to, uh, to survive during this year. But, but there are also things Israel's not forbidden to eat. In other words, there can be food gathered uh, that is not from crops, not from the planting of crops or the reaping of, of, of crops. And uh, so this, this becomes just another reminder of the fact that God's Sabbath law and God's Sabbath principle for Israel uh, is one that is not just for the people, but, uh, but also for the land. And then you might not think about the fact that also means for agricultural animals. So in other words, if you're not plowing and, uh, and you're not tilling the ground, then uh, hey, the ox have a bit of a sabbatical too. And I'm sure you got to both feed them and keep them busy, but uh, they are not uh, working as they would normally work. Now, just think about how this would work into the entire understanding of time, the entire understanding of time. You know, I was, uh, I was reading uh, last night the fact that, uh, whether, whether we think about it or not, one of the most determinative calendar issues in the United States of America was established in 1789 in a constitution which probably wasn't thinking that the entire culture is now going to be in a four-year obsession. But because the national elections were established every four years, it turns out that from that point on, whether just the political class or the entire nation, and increasingly the, the entire nation, we, we live on this four-year cycle. And, and, and not only that, as you know, it's a four-year cycle in which the political activity doesn't wait until the third year. It's, a, it's just a constant four-year cycle. And so you, everybody's thinking about it all the time. And I realize you say, well, I'm not thinking about it all the time. Well, you sort of are, whether you think you are or not. At least it's always in the background of your mind. You know, when you think of President X, you think of, well, you know, he's got two more years before he faces the voters or, or he can't run again. In other words, it's just a part of the background all the time. Well, in, uh, in Israel, it's a seven-year pattern. And, and that's just really important because that goes back to creation, the seven-day pattern of creation. It goes back to the Sabbath, which was God's institution for his covenant nation in terms of the, the Sabbath day in which they were not to work, but were to rest following his own example in creation. And now it turns out that not the universal land, and here's what's really important, this is not a universal command. This is for Israel. That's just really important to recognize. So God is not saying all the peoples of the earth uh, are to give the, uh, the land a rest in a seventh year. But Israel is. Now, you go to the book of Deuteronomy, and, and uh, there's a repeated refrain in the book of Deuteronomy, and that is, 
Does any, people, does any other people have laws so good? Search and find any nation which has laws so sweet. And uh, that's God's covenant law with Israel. And it has everything to do with things such as this. While other nations deplete, and, and look, there's no soil analysis. There's no chemical analysis of the soil. Israel's not, Israel has not by its own intelligence devised the need for the crop uh, rotation and the soil rest. This is God's revelation. And it will be to the strengthening of Israel. Now it gets even more abstracted in verse 8. You shall count seven weeks of years, seven times seven years, so that the time of the seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Now, I, I appreciate this, by the way. I think in either English or Hebrew, uh, this particular verse is one of the trickiest if God did not define it. Uh, because it's, it's, the, it, it's, a, it's a complex phrase that you and I, I don't think, would ever use. And so it's sort of like, I think the Holy Spirit figuring out, we would not figure that out, who says, by the way, that's 49. <laughs> because I, I'm not sure I would have understood 49. You shall count seven weeks of years. It's a very interesting, uh, complex phrase. Seven weeks of years. Seven times seven years. Well, that's 49 years. So that the time of seven weeks of years shall give you 49 years. Now, that would make no sense to us. Okay, so you've got a 14-year-old at home. She's having her 14th birthday. And you go, uh, happy two weeks of years. We're here to celebrate, you know, Chloe's two weeks of years. Next time we have a week of years, she'll be 21. Now, we don't think in weeks of years. But the point is, Israel is a week is a weak culture, W-E-E-K. The Sabbath and the course of the week is so central to the structure that even where we would speak of decades, and then we do, we speak of decades, the decades of this, the decades of that, Israel thinks in weeks of years. The Jubilee year, of course, is the 49th year. Verse 9, Then you shall sound the loud trumpet on the tenth day of the seventh month, on the day of atonement, you shall sound the trumpet throughout all your land, and you shall consecrate the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land to all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you when each of you shall return to his property and each of you shall return to his clan. That 50th year shall be a jubilee for you. In it you shall neither sow nor reap what grows of itself, nor gather the grapes from the undressed vines. For it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You may eat the produce of the field. In this year of Jubilee, each of you shall return to his property, and if you make a sale to your neighbor or buy from your neighbor, you shall not wrong one another. You shall pay your neighbor according to the number of years after the Jubilee, and he shall sell to you according to the number of years for crops. If the years are many, you shall increase the price, and if the years are few, you shall reduce the price, for it is the number of the crops that he is selling to you. You shall not wrong one another, but you shall fear your God, for I am the Lord your God. Therefore, you shall do all my statutes and keep my rules and perform them, and then you will dwell in the land securely. The land will yield its fruit, and you will eat your fill and dwell in it securely. And if you say, what shall we eat in the seventh year if we may not sow or gather in our crop? I will command my blessing on you in the sixth year so that it will produce a crop sufficient for three years. When you sow in the eighth year, you will be eating some of the old crop. You shall eat the old until the ninth year when its crop arrives." It's an astounding passage, and, uh, and, and one I think most Christians probably just don't know, uh, maybe you've read when reading through Leviticus, but it's, uh, it's, it's massively important. It's also massively misused. So, for example, uh, uh, controversy over President Biden uh, announcing uh, a cancellation of student debt, and, uh, and some people are saying, look, there should just be a jubilee year. In, in which, uh, after a certain number of years, every, all debts are forgiven. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's an argument you hear. 
You'll notice that uh, Democratic bankers are not joining in the clamor for that, uh, that particular principle. And, uh, and it would be absolutely unworkable because the system we have now of loans is not the same thing as the land forfeiture and indebtedness that you find here. For one thing, family wealth is entirely established by an assignment to the land. So this is not just someone, say, owns a piece of property and gets into financial trouble and has to take out a mortgage on the piece of property. No, this is, this is something far more severe. And uh, in Israel's covenant structure, the land uh, belongs to families, and, it's, and the, the families have the land restored to them. But by the way, not without a cost. Uh, you, you, you may notice that there still is to be a reckoning of the cost. But once again, even as the lex talionis limited the, uh, the retributive justice, in this case, this limits the... Uh, and and, and uh, there's a very important principle here to note because it's not said out loud, but, but, but it is here. Uh, it, it's implicit, and that is, this is, there's no interest. And so you pay back... Uh, because what the person gained was not the ownership of your land, but the use of it for crops. And so the value of the crops was the value of the, uh, uh, of the use of the property. And so there's just to be justice, which is very much hammered out in this passage. Uh, and, uh, and yet, as, as the Old Testament law unfolded, already there's the anticipation that this is going to be different in the city than in the country. And so a distinction will be made uh, between the, uh, the land outside the walls of a city and the land inside the walls of a city. Now, what's, what's the crucial difference? It can't be ownership. No, the crucial difference is agriculture. So uh, the, the land outside the wall is where the agriculture takes place. The... Uh, the economy that we have now uh, is an economy in which currency itself is a good. Uh, it may be a symbolic good, but it's a good, which is to say you can speculate in currency. And, uh, and, and furthermore, uh, when you are anticipating, say, uh, results that would come by an increase or gains by means of investment, uh, it includes whatever real thing may be the source of the investment. That may be nothing more than a business plan. Um, it's not always anything real or tangible. But, uh, but the money itself is also now uh, a matter of speculation, a matter of uh, currency exchange, and, uh, and, and, and a matter of, uh, of anticipated investment value and, and economic manipulation. Which is to say, we're living in a, in a very different time. And uh, there is no way that the Jubilee year principle works outside the covenant system in which land is allotted to tribes and to peoples. And so you do see people who will come up with it, but uh, it's just not the same economic system that we have now. Now, that's not to say that what we have now is in every way perfect and just. It, it is to say that we are not working in a covenant situation in which certain land has been allotted to us by the Creator, and uh, thus is to be returned to us in the integrity of the covenant nation. We're in a very, very different situation. There's some biblical principles, to be sure, but by the time you add the New Testament to the Old, those biblical principles are, uh, are, are really what had been adopted in the main, uh, within Western civilization, as uh, the main moral rules uh, to be used in, uh, in an economy that would be not totally just and righteous, but more totally just and righteous. The big issue here is that the land is also to experience a Sabbath. And uh, there is a, another interesting wrinkle here at the end of this passage where God actually explains how that's going to work and how they will eat and uh, so you'll notice that on the, on the sixth year, there's to be a super harvest. And what's really interesting is, is that God says that in the sixth year, he will give them a three-year harvest. And so you read that at first and you go, well, wow, 
that's one year extra. You know, there, there is the sixth year, you need to harvest for that year, and then there's the seventh year when you can't pl plow, you can't sow, you can't reap. Okay, so why not a two-year harvest? Well, you need, just need to think, where most of us are not living by farming, but the reason is because in the rotation of crops, the crops come months after the sowing. So, in other words, because you can't either sow or reap in that seventh year, if you have nothing to eat during that time, and then you sow a crop in the, what, what would be the, you could say the eighth year, or according to their calendar, the new first year, well, you still got months to wait until there's any food. Even though you are now allowed to plant and you are allowed to plow, uh, good luck eating dirt. But it just shows you, again, what Israel will say, and you'll hear this in the refrain in Deuteronomy, is there any other God who has given his people such just and wonderful laws? You know, he, he not only tells us you have to leave the land fallow and cannot eat of your crops or, or even of the grape of the vine that seventh year, and you guys figure out how you're going to do that, but instead he says, I will give you three years crop in the sixth year. And because Israel, I mean, honestly, if I hear that, I don't live by the planting of crops, so I hear that, I think I got to take one year off, then the previous year, I need two years crops. Oh, no, you don't, buddy. Uh, if you want to survive, you actually need three years crops. It's just a, a sweet sign of God's provision. Now, about the land in, uh, and, and its redemption, in verse 23, the land shall not be sold in perpetuity, for the land is mine. Now, that, again, shows the covenant nature of this economic condition. So, in other words, not only does the person who uses the land because it has been assigned to him in a debt, not only does he not own it, the owner doesn't own it. God owns it. It's a basic principle in Israel. The covenant nation in the covenant land, the covenant people are assigned their habitation, and they actually own it, but they don't own it. Uh, God is the ultimate owner, and that's why he gets to set all the rules. In verse 24, and in all the country you possess, you shall allow a redemption of the land. Now you see how it works. In verse 25, if your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. If a man has no one to redeem it, then he himself becomes prosperous and, and finds sufficient means to redeem it. Let him calculate the years since he sold it and buy back the balance to the man to whom he sold it, and then return his property. And this is returned to his property. But if he has not sufficient means to recover it, then what he sold shall remain in the hand of the buyer until the year of Jubilee. In the Jubilee it shall be released, and he shall return to his property. Okay, as I said, the distinction with the city is coming, but let's just take this rural example that is given to us here of how this works. So you have two people, they each have land allotted to them in the biblical divine allocation. Uh, allocation by tribes and eventually by families. So let's just say that uh, this row of seats is a field, this row of seats is a field. We got four fields here uh, and then some extraneous property but, uh, and some higher elevations, but <laughs> the mountain crops. But down, down here in the valley, we, we've got these four different fields. So let's say that one family is assigned this field and another family assigned this field. This family becomes indebted to this family and sells their land. But it's not really a sale. It, it's, it's a lease. And it, it's a lease that will become defined for the goods from the land. And at any point, redemption uh, can take place. So... The most interesting thing here, and, and so something should just leap out at us massively here. Something should, something should jump out at us having to do with our salvation right here. Because embedded in this passage is a messianic promise that has to do with our substitutionary uh, salvation, that is to say, Christ is our substitute on the cross. And I want to show you where it is. 
In verse 25, if your brother becomes poor and sells part of his property, then his interest redeemer, his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold, his nearest redeemer. The Hebrew word is goel, the kinsman redeemer. Now, this gets to an understanding, this is as far as we'll get today, but what an incredibly powerful point on which to end. In the family, and remember we have four families, four fields. This family is tied into a network of relationships in which some male relative is designated as the kinsman redeemer. This is a massive support system for Israel. So let's say that inside the family, a father is killed, leaving children who, uh, who are desperately needy. There will be a close male relative who is to be the kinsman redeemer, who is then to take the responsibility to take care in the absence of that man, uh, of his family. Vengeance, as you will see elsewhere in the New Testament, is sometimes carried out by the kinsman redeemer. Now, let's just say that that this family with this field, this family with this field, this family with this field, and, and then the last, let's say that the, the relationships are such that the kinsman redeemer for this family is actually over here. Then it is that man's job to try to help this man who lost his field and his family regain his field. That, that man will be his advocate, that man will be his help. That man, if this man dies, will continue to make certain that the justice is accomplished. If there is an act of, of criminality against someone in this family, then the kinsman redeemer, who may be the closest male relative, maybe over here, he bears the responsibility to do this. And you say, what does this have to do with salvation? It is because the goel is the kinsman redeemer. That is the word promised for the redeemer who will come to save from sin, who is the kinsman redeemer, the goel who is not merely one of us, but who can, can redeem his kinsmen. And that's Christ. Christ is the kinsman redeemer. He is the one who, as our closest male relative, for the word became flesh and dwelt among us, he is the only relative who can save us. And he does so through his own substitution, the atonement accomplished in his blood. Here it's economic, but it's moral. You'll notice it's moral. And, uh, and you'll notice it's not about what is often described as merely the forgiveness of a debt, because it, it, it's not just about the forgiveness of a debt, it's about the payment of a debt. It's, it's about how justice is to be administered. And you'll notice just like the laws of retributive justice limited how much retribution could take place. Here you have a limit on how much economic uh, injury or, uh, or economic exchange uh, may be made, even if, for instance, there is this sale of land, which we know is actually not the sale of land like we would know it today. It's just a very, very sweet thing having to do with the brother who becomes poor, sells part of his property, then his nearest redeemer shall come and redeem what his brother has sold. Now, when we come back next Sunday, next Lord's Day, we'll look at verse 29, and uh, just, I actually think we can see this pretty quickly so that we can move on. If a man sells a dwelling house in a walled city, he may redeem it within a year of its sale, for a full year he shall have the right of redemption. If it is not redeemed within a full year, then the house in the walled city shall belong in perpetuity to the buyer. Throughout his generations it shall not be released in the jubilee. But the houses of the villages that have no wall around them shall be classified with the fields of the land. They may be redeemed, and they shall be released in the jubilee. As for the cities of the Levites, the Levites may redeem at any time the houses in the cities they possess. And if one of the Levites exercises his right of redemption, then the house that was sold in the city they possess shall be released in the jubilee. For the houses and the cities of the Levites are their possession among the people of Israel, but the fields of pasture land belonging to their cities may not be sold, 
for that is their possession forever. So just working backwards very quickly, this is the book of Leviticus, and we're talking about the Levites. So that's not a coincidence. The Levites are given particular priestly responsibilities, and thus they have particular protections uh, economically. But then working backwards, just in conclusion, there is this distinction between agricultural land and the land inside the city. The land inside the city, which is not agricultural, operates by different rules. And, uh, and, and in most cases, it is not covered by the year of Jubilee. It does not automatically return to the one who was its owner. And that, by the way, sets up some of the distinction that you will see in the New Testament when you compare some of what is preached and is the material of parables in a place like Galilee, as Jesus tells them, as compared to what is said in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a walled city, inside the walled city, different culture. In Galilee, farming community, different culture uh, as well. Uh, I, I do want to just end on the kinsman redeemer being the sweet overarching theme here, where all of a sudden in the law of Israel and this Levitical expression uh, and the details and the minutia of the law here, all of a sudden arrives a kinsman redeemer and uh, it turns out that this is pointing to our salvation by the one who came not to redeem our land nor our honor um, but the totality of who we are and to redeem us from our sin let's pray father we're just so thankful first of all that we are redeemed by jesus the goel Father, may we read every text of Scripture as pointing to Christ and fulfilled in Him. And Father, may the text we read today, may even in the details, may these texts remind us of the glory of what you have accomplished through the covenant, which is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.